And good morning, everyone. Welcome into another edition of Sports Medicine Weekly on this Saturday morning. Steve Cashel and Dr. Brian Cole. I'm the Bulls radio host. Dr. Cole, Cole, of course, is the head team physician for the Chicago Bulls, one of the team physicians for the Chicago White Sox, sports medicine specialist, orthopedic surgeon, Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. Dr. Cole, how are you this morning? I'm doing great, Steve. Great to see you. Good. We're going to start talking about... uh, Midwest Orthopedics at Rush, where you work, and I know it's a world leader in minimally evasive outpatient surgery and quite an accomplishment for one of your doctors. Uh, you know, let me just first qualify it, but when I was a resident and we would do a hip or a knee replacement, patients would generally be in the hospital between five and seven days. Really? And it was heroic if you could get the patient out within three days. They were typically getting blood transfusions. It was just, it was a whole, they'd come in the night before. They get pre-op the night before, sleep at the hospital, and then we would fill the whole day with joint replacements, and they'd stay three to five, sometimes seven days. Wow. And the complication rate was, you know, was was higher. Now I will tell you that, you know, at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush, uh, where I would really say that outpatient, I would say minimally invasive surgery in the realm of joint replacement, but outpatient surgery the same day is was a real milestone. So we're proud to have my partner, uh, this morning, Dr. Richard Berger, who, uh, as I understand it, he can clarify, recently completed his 10,000th minimally invasive outpatient joint replacement surgery. Lots more minimally invasive surgeries, maybe twice that, but 10,000 outpatient joint replacement surgeries. So, uh, Dr. Berger, Rich, uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Great to have you. Well, Stephen, Brian, thank you so much for that really nice introduction. Yes, it's a great honor to be with you. And Yes, it's my 10,000th, but I just completed at the end of last year, so a couple weeks ago, my 10,000th outpatient joint replacement. And yeah, like you mentioned, when I was doing my residency about the same time, about 25 years ago, patients stayed in the hospital for five, six, seven, sometimes even even 10 days. That was the norm. You know, we made a great big incision. We cut everything, and patients had a lot of pain and a lot of dysfunction. We had to get them through their pain teach them how to walk again, which took, you know, five or seven days, and then they finally got out of the hospital. So about 20 years ago, I started to wonder if there's a better way of doing joint replacement, that is, without cutting the muscles, ligaments, and tendons, minimally invasive joint replacement. Everyone said I was crazy at the time, and I probably was, but I spent about two years developing some instruments, developing some surgical techniques, practiced on a bunch of cadavers, and uh, 18 years ago, did my first minimally invasive hip replacement. And the patients felt so good right away without cutting the muscles, ligaments, and tendons that they were ready to go home almost right away. In fact, some of them felt so good a couple hours after surgery, they said, why do I need to stay in the hospital? And I said, well, you don't. And those patients walked out of the hospital. We took that same technique after practicing a little bit on knees with cadavers, and we started doing it in knee replacements about two years later. Since then, as you said, I probably did about uh, 17,000 minimally invasive surgeries, and now 10,000 of those went home the day of surgery. So they have less pain and a much quicker and a much fuller recovery. It's amazing how things have changed. Visiting with Dr. Richard Berger, hip and knee replacement specialist, orthopedic surgeon, Midwest Orthopedics at Rush, just completing recently his 10,000th minimally invasive outpatient joint replacement surgery. It's amazing, Dr. Cole, how these things have changed, right? Yeah, I would say that one of the most exciting things about orthopedics is that it's been said that our body of knowledge changes, uh, doubles every five years, you know? So when you think about it, just, and that's one of the things why we're all so passionate about what we do. I can tell you, Rich, and he can speak for himself, probably spends a couple of months a year traveling and teaching. And, you know, that's sort of all academic philanthropy, if you will. We spend, you know, we spend a lot of our time trying to teach others how to make the field better. And just, you know, the te- it's, and it's very technique-driven. Rich, have, would you say that things have changed uh, it, significantly over the last 10 years or so, or are you pretty much doing it very similar as to when you started? No, we're constantly improving. You know, the patients who we did, you know, back when we first started 18 years ago, they recovered quickly and well, but the patients now are so much quicker. In fact, now at this point, from the time we finish the surgery till the time the patient goes home in their car is about two hours. And now I have patients who are literally, literally going back to work 
that afternoon. Wow. That is, that's crazy, but that happens. But it's pretty routine that patients are back to their desk job in five to seven days, back working. You know, it used to be that they were off for months and months and months, had a very slow recovery. Now they're back to work, recover really quick. And this opens up joint replacement to a whole new group of people, younger people who can't afford to time off, can't afford to have months and months and months of not taking care of their family, can now, instead of taking vacation to Disney World, come to Rush, have outpatient surgery, and go back to work a week later. Some people, in fact, don't even tell their work they're having surgery. They just come back a week later after vacation, walking fine, out of pain, and are back working. Great stuff. Dr. Berger, out of time. Congratulations on your uh, wonderful accomplishment, and uh, I love the way you explain it. It's great stuff. It's amazing how science has come uh, this far. Thank you for having me. Dr. Richard Berger from Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. Three, two, one. Our next guest here on Sports Medicine Weekly is Chris Stout, talking a little bit about artificial intelligence. Chris is a vice president of research and data analytics at ATI Physical Therapy. Before we get to Chris, uh, Dr. Cole, you've been doing some things in AI or artificial intelligence, haven't you? You know, it's that when people hear the term artificial intelligence, um, and we'll have Chris sort of elaborate on it because I still need to learn exactly what it is, but you almost get this feeling that things kind of happen by themselves vis-a-vis a computer, right? But whatever a computer does needs data, and needs to sure. be, the data needs to be coded properly. So the stuff that we're doing, uh, working with a, a startup company, and we're capturing the entire surgical procedures of shoulder procedures. And then he's basically at the pixel level, the smallest level of sort of resolution when you, you know, to, to visually or optically see something, he's reconstructing it and, and coding it. And then we're able to take the, we're going to potentially use that for um, uh, competency testing for teaching procedures to other, to other young residents and fellows. So that's how we're using artificial intelligence. But I, I think probably the public needs a good explanation as to what it is, and I think I can't do it justice. So Chris Stout uh, from uh, ATI, who's a, 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 a clinical professor in the College of Medicine at U of I. Um, also, I know you work with ATI. Just give our audience a, a brief lesson on what it is and how you're using it. Well, sure. Uh, thanks. Good to be back on, you guys. Um, artificial intelligence, I mean, most people might have an experience of it if they have an Alexa at home. And basically, how does Alexa start to learn how to respond or how to recognize people's voices? How does Facebook start to recognize people's faces when and they tag them? And they have a pretty good likelihood of being able to do that. So to your point about um, your project looking at, at pixels, those pixels get turned into data. Our voices get turned into data if we're talking to Alexa or something like that. And there's intelligence that drives that, but it, it keeps learning. It doesn't. It's not just wrote. It doesn't just happen one time. The, the machine learning, if you will, gets better and better, and it iterates. It learns. It, makes, it, it gets over those mistakes. It gets better with understanding your voice over time. So if you're talking to Siri or Alexa, the more you do that, the more data it has and the better it is about being able to properly understand what you're saying or what you're wanting to see and then being able to respond that way. So, Chris, t- what, what are you doing in the therapy space? Where, what, what, tell us about that. Sure. Um, well, similar to what you're, you're talking about, there's a lot of areas where uh, data can come in to help inform decisions. And we're <clears throat> pardon me, at a very beginning, nascent stage to take that data <clears throat> and combine it with what the literature says to help inform treatment planning in our electronic medical record. So, for example, um, no one has time to go to the proverbial stacks and read what the literature says about all the different kinds of things about treating different uh, post-op injury, post-surgical injuries, things like that. So um, we can't, with, within all the clinics that we have and with all the therapists we have, expect them to keep up with that. So our, part of what my department's doing right now is taking uh, clinical guidelines in terms of treatment and then being able to see uh, how we apply that with our patients and then how that what those outcomes turn out to be. And even though you may have an empirically based treatment guideline to help guide a, pa- guide a therapist through that patient's journey, we know that patients are different from one another. They might be a different age. They might be a different body type. They might have experienced their injury with some other comorbidities that make them maybe a little bit more complicated case. 
So after a year's worth of, of iterating and data uh, collecting and tweaking, we want to then look back and see how can we uh, change those guidelines to be able to be more specific to the idiosyncratic differences of the patients that we see. Visiting with Chris Stout here on Sports Medicine Weekly. Chris is a vice president, Department of Research and Data Analytics with ATI. And Chris, uh, we're talking about artificial intelligence. How big is the gap between the public expectations of AI and its actual capabilities? Well, um, that's quite a variable question because there's so much diversity in medicine. Uh, I would say um, that it's it's very good and probably exceeds expectations in areas where AI is very powerful, which is in diagnostics and which is in imaging. And the reasons for that, again, goes back to Dr. Cole's example of, you know, getting down to the pixels and turning those data into something that's that's helpful and knowledgeable. But um, the speed in which, like AI in um, radiology and MRI exams, there's a a uh, company that just came out last year with an FDA-approved uh, tool to be able to look at MRIs, and they can speed up the process of an, uh, an MRI review to 15 seconds of what would typically take a human 30 minutes to come up with the same kind of diagnosis. Yeah, I could see how that. I could see how that. Now that I understand it, I could see how that would happen. It's basically an automated process that leads to that. One of the things that we're looking at is you can capture a whole surgical procedure, and it could actually. You know, we have to transcribe every operation we do. We dictate it. So mm-hmm. the the AI platform, for lack of a better word, you can correct me if you wish, uh, can take the surgical procedure that's been captured and create a dictation for all the steps you do for documentation purposes and then actually bill it and submit it for coding purposes for insurance uh, reimbursement. That's mm-hmm. that's a goal. I'm you know we're still trying to find all the value of this. Sometimes I I feel like it's it's you you've got new technology. You're trying to find a place for it when you have this new technology. Uh, right. But uh, but it is particularly exciting. And if we could be better at our job and be more efficient uh, through and this doesn't seem like once it's up up and running that the cost of using it is particularly expensive. But obviously the development time mm-hmm. and costs I imagine are are particularly large. Right. Yeah. It's and it, you're right. It's all front end loaded for these kinds of things. Yeah. And then the ability to sort of propagate that out um, becomes much and much uh, more affordable and and much um, less complicated uh, over time. Once you've got the algorithm built, you just continue to feed it. Chris Stout, appreciate you joining us here on Sports Medicine Weekly. It's a pleasure. Take care, you guys. All righty. Back with our staple of the show, our Ask the Doctor segment. Stay with us. Sports Medicine Weekly, only on 670 The Score. Back here on this Saturday morning, Steve Cashel, Dr. Brian Cole. It is Sports Medicine Weekly, Chicago's premier sports medicine program. Net proceeds from our show, Sports Medicine Weekly, go to support orthopedic research at Rush through the liveactivenow.org fund. Our producer, board operator, Shane Reardon. Coordinating producer is Teresa Ann Seeger. Dr. Cole, time now for our staple of the show, Ask the Doctor, becoming more popular. I'm on the street. Everyone asks me, hey, can you ask Dr. Cole this question? I said, write it in because you can write it in. Go to our website, our main page, sportsmedicineweekly.com, and on the right side of our home page, you can see the picture of Dr. Cole and myself and click on the link underneath that, and it's our Ask the Doctor. You can ask the doc a question. Got some good questions for you, Dr. Cole. Here's the first one coming from Catherine. Here we go. What's the youngest age a patient can receive a patellofemoral knee replacement, and how long does this particular replacement last? Well, so I think the audience needs to understand that the knee has sort of uh, three compartments. In other words, there's three major places in the knee. One is what we call the tibial femoral surface. That's where the shin bone meets the end of the thigh bone. And there's the medial or inner and the lateral and the outer. And then there's the patellofemoral joint, which is what's in front. That's where the kneecap sort of tracks on the groove in the front of the femur, right? So that's the one that gets involved with a lot of pain going up and down stairs in front and so forth. So patella femoral arthritis or kneecap arthritis as it, as it moves or glides in the front of the knee is pretty common. The good news is most people don't even know they have it and they don't have symptoms. But when they, but when they do, and as they get older, and when I mean older, sort of the 45-year-old group and, and older, it gets particularly challenged to treat that with non-joint replacement techniques. Now, we've done really well with some new things, Steve, looking at transplants of that part of the, that part of the knee. Uh, but when it doesn't work and people have a profound amount of knee pain, 
uh, due to arthritis in the front of their knee, we can do what's called a patella femoral replacement. So that's the same type of titanium cobalt chrome implant that we use for normal knee replacements. It's just a limited knee replacement in the front of the knee only, and that can be 12 to 15 years routinely before it might have to be changed over to a full knee replacement. So some will look at it as a transition step uh, to a full knee replacement when the arthritis only lives in the front of the knee. Yeah, does Rush do the custom patella femoral replacements? Yeah, my, some of my partners are now doing that. I, we don't know to date if it's actually making a difference, but uh, truth be told, uh, there are people doing it and it's available. All right, great question from Catherine. We appreciate that. Next question, Dr. Cohen, our Ask the Doctor segment. Does winter weather really affect arthritis pain? That's a great question. Yeah, so here's the thing about arthritis. Arthritis is um, has an effect on our ability to perceive barometric pressure change. So there are pressure receptors in all of our joints. And what a lot of my patients will say is, I can predict the rain. Or when I go to Arizona, when it's drier, I don't feel that achiness that I normally get or my knee doesn't swell as much. Or other joints, hip and shoulder and so forth. So lots of people end up moving to warmer, drier climates where there's uh, different swings in barometric pressure and it doesn't affect their arthritis as much. They're not as symptomatic. So it's not necessarily winter. It's when there are, sw- when there are swings in barometric pressure, cooler weather. All of that can actually aggravate and make someone feel a bit worse when they have arthritis, and that can be remedied by, by moving. You know, let me add to that. A physical therapist told me the other day that you or a orthopedic surgeon can remove arthritis. I took that as, wow, I didn't realize that. Is that, mm, is that, that an simple. accurate statement? Not that simple. The answer is yes, but it depends on which joint. So small joints, let's just say like the AC joint on top of your shoulder, the acromioclavicular joint where the clavicle meets the scapula, yeah. otherwise known as weightlifter's shoulder, that joint can get arthritic in really active individuals who do weightlifting like bench press and lat pull downs, right? Okay. And that one we just remove the arthritis. However, and what does that mean, remove the arthritis? We basically, there's enough uh, excess bone in the end of the collarbone that we can take out 8 to 10 millimeters of the clavicle or the collarbone to open up the space where it's arthritic so they no longer touch and they no, no longer hurt. That's not an option in a knee. If we go in a knee or a shoulder that's arthritic, we can clean up loose pieces of debris and things like that that are related to the arthritis or the cartilage loss, but you can't just get rid of the bone and cartilage without replacing it with something. So in our world, we can clean people up or what we call debride them. We do that a lot in professional athletes to buy them time, but it may be incomplete and not last very long. Sometimes athletes will get them yearly. We get a debridement where we clean up the arthritis, but you just don't get rid of it. So the flip side is that when the, the alternatives for those bigger joints, once you clean them out, then they get replaced. How do you replace them? In the younger patients, we might use a cartilage transplant, a graft of some sort. In older patients, we do with metal and plastic with a joint replacement. I'm always thinking arthritis is uh, forever. You know? <laughs> well, it's not. I mean, you know, there's some disease states which you can't, that you can't treat um, other than with ongoing medications. The, the amazing thing about orthopedics and arthritis is that, it, is that you can definitively treat it, and you can replace it, and patients can do great. So it's not like other simple diseases, but the flip side is that when you do well, you do really well. So arthritis is not forever, but most of the treatment is really managing symptoms. It's, you don't necessarily have to get rid of the disease to feel better. We have lots and lots of things we can do that don't get rid of the disease, but people can feel better, and that's oral anti-inflammatories, glucosamine chondroitin sulfate, collagen HD. Um, you can use uh, natural anti-inflammatories like turmeric, um, uh, arth- uh, uh, injections of steroids, lubricants, um, all kinds of things that can be used to reduce the symptoms of arthritis. And if it doesn't work, then there's surgery. Next question here in our Ask the Doctor segment. Dr. Cole, this one comes from uh, Jimmy in Downers Grove. It seems as though there can be detrimental effects from the sun. However, can the sun ever be a positive for an individual? Yeah, it's an interesting question. We've now, you know, while we all know that sun can be uh, bad for your skin, aging and so forth, and more importantly, can lead to different types of skin cancer and even melanoma, right? But sun, we've now created an age where we have sort of an epidemic of individuals who are vitamin D deficient. So the sun sun can do a lot for us. Obviously, we do it in moderation, and it's essential for lots of functions. For example, vitamin D, it's important for bone health. It's anti-cancer. It supports the immune system. It can protect against dementia and brain aging. It's good for losing excess fat. 
It can de- decrease symptoms of asthma, and it can even strengthen your teeth, right? So vitamin D is super important. And, in fact, we have vitamin D deficiency in our NBA players. It's a, a subject of intense uh, uh, study showing that our NBA players are just not getting enough sun. And I'll take it one step further. I've seen even in uh, training rooms where they have a, a tanning booth that's used in moderation to increase vitamin D. It's that important for some of our athletes, but it has to be done responsibly uh, given the, the negative effects of, of sun exposure. So sun can be good. Uh, some, there's some data that shows that sunlight and whole food can send breast cancer into remission. There's some data even on that. It kills bacteria. Uh, it can have some benefit on psoriasis and other skin conditions. Obviously, that's weighed against the negative. It can lower cholesterol. There's some data that shows that uh, it can actually uh, convert high cl- uh, cholesterol in, in the blood into steroid hormones and, and the sex hormones we need for reproduction. In the absence of sunlight, actually, the opposite happen, happens, that we see more cholesterol increase. So uh, there's lots of potential benefits, but it's got to be in moderation and um, uh, weighed against uh, the, the negative potential effects of skin cancer and other things, which certainly are a big problem. All right, last one here. Bill in Lake Forest asking you this, Dr. Cole. I have pain in my forearm below the elbow. I'm wearing a compression sleeve or brace, which is help, but what's the next step? Would a cortisone shot help? Sounds like that tennis elbow, golf yeah, elbow we've yeah, talked about. Yeah, if he's wearing a tennis elbow brace, which is what he's describing, then indeed, very common condition. You, in fact, there's more tennis elbow, which is the outer side of the elbow, that you see in golf than you do in tennis. So we see a lot of tennis elbow in golfers even though there's a condition known as golfer's elbow. So on the golfer's outer, on the yeah, inside? That's right. Golfer, you hit it fat, it hurts like heck. That's golfer's elbow. And tennis elbow is on the outer side. And indeed, you know, the, the mainstay is non-surgical treatment, uh, therapy such as stretching modalities like electric stim and things of that nature. And then we do use corticosteroid injections. We will often use platelet-rich plasma where we draw blood, spin it down a centrifuge and inject into that area. And then a little bit of activity uh, modification can make a huge difference. Uh, most people will get better with proper treatment, but it's one you want to treat early, not, not let it go chronic longstanding because it gets much harder to uh, resolve. You know, we've talked about PRP in the past, and I know you do it on the professional athletes. Are you doing it more often now on the everyday patients? Absolutely. Yeah, and every day I have patients in the office in the clinic. We do uh, utilize platelet-rich plasma for arthritis of the shoulder, for rotator cuff tendinitis. We use it for osteoarthritis of the knee. For tendonitis, I use it for uh, knee, uh, patella tendonitis, frequently for lateral epicondylitis. So uh, we have emerging evidence for a variety of conditions that it can be beneficial, but you got to ask your doctor about the data and their experience. So you're taking blood out of, let's say, the hip maybe? No, no, out of the peripheral blood, like a blood draw if you went to get your blood tested for, you know, whatever. Okay. Yeah, it's very straightforward. We have a blood test. Then you that, spin it. Spin it down for five minutes, and it yields a couple cc's of uh, platelet-rich uh, solution. That the we good then, stuff the in the good blood. stuff, right, right. And then uh, we inject it into the area that's uh, particularly painful or affected. Oh, great stuff. I remember the first time I heard about that. I think you did it to Kirk Heinrich in yep. his, uh, right, he had kind of a skier's thumb. Well, the first time, I something. think the first time we ended up doing was with Ben Gordon, who had a, uh, really? a, a, a bad hamstring strain. And then this is when, you know, associated with the team. But we've been doing a lot for that type of stuff. And then uh, ended up doing with um, with Kurt, who had a uh, a chronic hamstring thing that nothing was getting him better. And we did that, and he got better. It was, you know, pretty profound. Absolutely. Great stuff. That will do it for this edition of Sports Medicine Weekly. Many thanks to our producer, Shane Reardon. Our coordinating producer is Teresa Ann Seeger. Also want to thank David Cole for managing our website and our business operations, as well as Samantha Smith for Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. For Dr. Brian Cole, I'm Steve Cashel saying so long, and thanks for listening to Sports Medicine Weekly here on 670 The Score. Up next on The Score, Early Odds with Joe Ostrowski. Talk with you again next week. Have a great Saturday, everybody.